Mathematics Manager for IBIS. Uh, that's the Integrated uh, Biodiversity Information System in Australia, I guess. <laughs> okay, you have the floor. Oh, if you if you want to move your things more. yourself. Yeah. Oh, I don't ah, know. you need your. Your I've just I've got my notes here. I thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Australian National Species List team. Um, am I ready to start? Yes. Thank you. Big deep breath. <laughs> uh, sorry, now I have to work out. I've got two things going. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture and we pay our respects to elders past and present. So the objective of my talk this afternoon is to just um, demonstrate how the Australian National Species List addresses some of the questions that have been posed by this symposium. Um, just for some context for those that haven't come across the Australian National Species List before, and I know there's many people in the room that have, um, we provide a, get going, going here, um, infrastructure to deliver two main products. One is a names index, which is like a bibliography of citations for taxonomic names and usages, and then an accepted taxonomy that is used as the backbone for a number of national species projects including the Atlas of Living Australia, uh, our Environmental Pro uh, <laughs> Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and some other the, uh, projects that we've heard here today. Uh, one that may not have come up in this forum over the week is a thing called AusTraits, which is a traits database for Australian flora, vascular flora. Just a little... Boy, um, a small snapshot of the coverage of data that we have. AFD is the Australian Faunal Directory, which is the zoological data, and the others are Atni, Fungi, Algae and Bryophyte, and we're merging lichens into fungi at the moment. Um, so we have a fair range of coverage of data, but as with all data sets, it's not 100% complete. So one of the main things that we... Um, need to take into account in a national species list that not all names are scientific names. We also capture phrase names, vernacular names. Uh, for historical reasons, we have a whole bunch of cultivars as part of the Australian cultivar register, uh, vernacular names, hybrids, etc. So there isn't one name source that we can go and get a name identifier for everything. We do not at the moment include viruses and bacteria in our data sets or other operational taxonomic units. So name identifiers in the national species list. Every name in the Australian national species list does have a globally unique name identifier and is delivered as a URI. The Australian national species list identifiers are required to deliver the products internally within our own systems and as for things like navigation of web links, but we also e e <laughs> expose them in our exports, APIs, and as linked data. A request for an identifier is resolvable to a resource with content negotiation. And beyond we, this particular symposium, is talking about name identifiers, but we have identifiers for other resources as well. But as we know, there's some challenges in doing this work. Stabilising name identifiers over time and maintaining that. Resolving historical usage or name identifiers when things do change. And I just needed to point out for all those people who use AFD that we currently can't supply a, name, a stable name identifier for the Australian Foreign Directory before I get shouted at. <laughs> uh, we're planning to put the Australian Foreign Directory into our... NSL infrastructure, at which point we will be able to deliver on that. So our name identifiers have that format, id.biodiversity.org.au, a name of uh, the fact that it's a name, which data set it's came from, and a unique identifier. 
that unique identifier in itself is also resolvable without the other parts of that. We also try to capture name identifiers from other sources. So we've just heard from the World Floor Online and we've heard from Captain Checklist Bank. We're all grappling with this issue as well. We want to link to other sources of data. We want to be able to participate in the linked data world and know that the name we're talking about is the same as everybody else's. But some of the challenges that we have are which data set to use? What's the source of truth for a name identifier? Is it the nomenclator? Is it a global data set? Which, which data set should we use? What's the identifier for? Is it, is it truly the name? Or is it some idea of a name or a taxa? We, we need to know that that object represents a scientific name. Completely, whoops, going the wrong way. Yeah, going that way. Completeness is, you know, we, we always, like everybody else, have issues with completeness and timeliness. Keeping up with changes is a challenge. Um, do the resources that we want to query have API support or do we need to download a data set, do the manual matching and then establish an identifier? Um, I noticed looking around, you know, there's a historical backlog. A lot of names that were published a long time ago and don't necessarily have a ZooBank ID, for example. Um, where do we get those things? And are they resolvable? We'd be nice. We'd prefer a resolvable identifier where possible. So just looking at how we use a name identifier in the Australian National Species List, the name is an object in itself. The name is the establishment or instantiation of that data and it's an, a fundamental data building block. Every usage of a name within a reference is associated with a name identifier. So we, we, what we've been hearing about name usages. So we model a, a name is a, has a usage in a reference the primary name within the, or the accepted name has a certain status and then all synonymy with, and all other related names are also related to a name and have a usage within that. That includes orthovaric variants, um, misapplications and other name relationships. The protologue we call a prime or protologue or primary reference is recorded and it, has, it basically establishes the name in the data set. So we try and have a citation for everything that we put in our data set. Taxonomic revisions and other taxonomically significant literature are recorded as a set of name usages and their relationship to the accepted name within that reference. So we can then start to build up a graph of names and their usages and how they've been used in different resources or different publications. The way we map that into a taxonomy is that the taxon concept of, and I'm not, I don't want to get into a discussion about taxon concepts versus taxa today, but if we think of that little fragment of accepted name and its synonymy as a taxon concept, the way that we build a taxon classification is to attach that concept to that point in the tree at a point in time. Each time the tree is republished, that shift that can change and shift. But we will always be able to resolve where a name is within that taxonomy at any point in time. Um, I, won't, I was going to talk a little bit about taxa, but I might not. <laughs> Other than to say we try to establish the point, that, that taxon concept within the classification, including its... Uh, children and its parentage and its circumscription. Excuse my, if I use the wrong words at the wrong time here, it's particularly technical words or domain-specific words. Um, so one of the challenges is balancing persistence of identifiers with resolution. Um, you know, persistent identifier can be globally unique, but it doesn't mean it's resolvable. So we can have a string, but that we can't find where that string is now resolving to because the service that did it no longer exists. 
So we want to try and build a stable and persistent and a identifier that has longevity. But sometimes there's competing interests like technology changes and how we do things changes and how we might come up with new schemes in the future doesn't aren't the things that we necessarily think of as immutable today. So one of the ways that we've tried to address this is to have a mapper or a broker. And the purpose of that broker is to provide a linked data service which maps an identifier via a URI through the back end. So this lets us redirect identifiers. Um, it lets us shift them around so that they are actually, um, particularly when we've, we've done work like we want to sync, not sync, that's the wrong word, um, move the lichens into a flungy classification as opposed to their own. We want to resolve where they go into a different place to where they were originally placed. We do have to deal with deduplication. Our data sets aren't perfect. We need to say this name, this name was entered twice. Somebody took that identifier and now we've moved it and said they've duplicate records. Thank you. Um, and we have had in the past identifiers that have been minted are no longer the same. But the, bro the mapper allows us to redirect those things. Um, quickly, the mapper. Basically, an identifier for a request for an identifier that no longer resolves is actually passed through the mapper and then returns the current mapped identifier to that thing. Uh, just some re reiterating what the sorts of reasons that we want to do that kind of work. We have we're still working on services a bit. Um, there's a range of services that we are trying to rewrite at the moment, but the first one we basically did was the name check service to allow people to get our local name identifier. Um, it basically will let you pass a string and it will give you um, the name identifiers that match that string within the national species list and it uses GN Parser to do some splitting of names so that we can take data, whether it's in a string or, or separated. Um, its purpose was to provide exact matches, so because of the, the use case that was given to us to work with. Um, we also want to work and get improve our name searching capacity, um, our tax on name resolution service in the sense of here's a name, where is it currently accepted and where in the classification does it fit? And we're also doing some work with the um, Biodiversity Data Repository Project in the department to build an RDF graph on the top of the technology that we have. So our overall objective is we would really like to anchor our name identifiers into where they were created, into the nomenclators or into a standard service so that as we exchange data and we link data, we know we're talking about the same thing. So where, you know, my questions are, where do we get that from? Who's the best source? Which one should we be using? Because every, all of these things take effort to go and to create. The fact that the World Floor Online has also got IPNI identifiers and um, other ones, you know, there's obviously a good source to start with. Um, so a bit of the future as I would like to see it is that soon as somebody is publishing a paper, those identifiers and that usage graph of names that they've used and how they've used them within that paper is somehow provided to us as data and we can then ingest it. We can have pre-registration of names, which is something I know already happens. And then we can take those, those concepts directly from those papers and we can build these different resources and start to have the, the identifiers to link between them over time. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything new. I think there's been that sort of, <laughs> um, what's the word? Nirvana State's been out there for some time, but I still feel like we're not kind of, kind of quite getting there. Uh, I'd also like to thank Endymion Cooper and Greg Whitbread in the work that we do and putting all this work together. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We have to uh, wait for the question until okay. the next session too because long. we are already too over long. time. Sorry. Uh, so, Andre is here. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Andre is the IT team coordinator for the Belgian uh, Biodiversity Information Facility. Belgian Biodiversity Platform. Platform. Sorry, I knew that I did something wrong. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> 